All right. Hi, guys. I'm Marie. And I'm Maddie. That was really quiet. Just started again. (laughs) Hi, guys. I'm Marie. And I'm Maddie. And we are here recording Lost in the Woods. Thank yep. you guys for being so great about us taking last week off for the 4th of July, which for us here in the United States is our independence. For you listeners elsewhere, hopefully you had a great weekend, even if it wasn't a holiday. Yeah. Yeah. One of our listeners said that they have Australia Day in January that's kind of similar, and they do fireworks. Oh, yeah. During that time. I know Canada Day is on the 3rd, I'm pretty sure. Is it? it? Okay, so it's interesting because we, we'd love to know what everybody does for the 4th. I'm sad if you don't celebrate something with fireworks because they're at least pretty fun. In, at some time in the year, you don't yeah. use fireworks. Although I think most people use the 4th as a reason to drink a lot and light things on fire. But a lot of it. families do barbecues. We like to do barbecues and just hang out and enjoy each other's company. And things like that. So I bet that was really nice. Medicine was working on I the actual fourth. Twelve hours on the fourth of July. Yeah, but we made up for it yesterday by going and spending what nine hours at the beach. Yeah, <laughs> no, that made up for it for me, for sure. So that was nice. We did have to drive a ways to chase down some sunshine and some I warmth. Did get stuck in a kayak with my little sister. I had to go rescue Madison and her sister who got. So the lake that we went to is like a glacier lake and it feeds into the river and Maddie and her sister Cordelia, they got sucked into that river feed and couldn't, cause her sister's younger. She could not, she paddle. couldn't paddle her way against the current and the wind. So they basically ended up like a couple miles down the river and had to get to shore which was a whole task all in itself and then maddie had to stay with the kayaks because they there's like a drop there was no way for us to get the kayaks out of the water i had to like sit in a kayak with my foot in the water holding the other (laughs) kayak in both paddles for like a good solid 30 minutes yep and then cordelia had to run all the way back to where we were which was over a mile away through the trails and so she gets back panicked she's crying she's like we caught stuck i had to leave maddie We hiked all the way back, although I didn't know how far it was. And then I had to paddle them back up the river. I was able to paddle. It was hard, though. It (laughs) was a lot of work. We we left the 11-year-old on shore, and me and Maddie paddled up against the current because we're a little stronger. So It was rough. It was just, (laughs) she was panicked. I was like, no, just it's it's fine. It's It's okay. Me and Maddie aren't panickers, so, like, when something does go wrong, and if you guys listen to our story about hiking with my sister last, not last week, but the The week week before. before. Last episode. On our last episode. We almost fell off a a cliff in our car, and Maddie and I were just like, okay. Okay. uh, Let's get ourselves out of this. Maddie, get your head out the window. Tell me if I'm getting too close to the edge. I'm trying to avoid the ice on the other side, and my sister's crying. (laughs) So, apparently, we can't do things without drama or risking our lives. I don't know. No. It's fine. Everybody's fine. But we had a blast. We sat on the beach. We enjoyed food and drink and water and sunshine. And it was amazing. Yeah. It yeah. was nice. It was nice. So we're back this week and we really appreciate the break. We don't take them very often, but it's nice every once in a while to get one. But yeah, so today we are starting part one of our second two-parter that we've ever done. Yay! And this is a crazy story because I had never heard of it before. I had never heard of it either before that. And I cannot believe I haven't heard of this before. And actually finding information on this case proved to be a little difficult. We had a little bit of trouble really tracking down information especially on the victims and so yeah. we did the best job that we could i read another book because that's what i end up doing she when we're researching book. I, books i swear she just thinks it's fun oh yeah let me read this <laughs> three thousand page book it's fine it was actually on my kindle which i don't know if you guys know how the pages work on a kindle but it was actually i think like 8500 pages long because they're small pages, right? Yeah. And so Still, when way, I got she in, just enjoys it. She likes it. She likes when it. When I got in like 4,000 pages, I was like, uh. But it was a good book. I'll tell you about it at the end. But it was 
a good book and it had good insight to it as well. Uh, Maddie prefers to find pictures and do lighter. like to watch YouTube videos. <laughs> Don't worry, I verify all of her information. <laughs> It's like I watch a YouTube video, some of it's not true, and she goes, where the hell did you find this information? I'm like, I watched a YouTube video. Like I said, I verify all of her information, don't worry. But we like to play this game where I'm like, okay, bring 10 facts to the table that I didn't know, and she hasn't been able to do it yet. No, because I don't read a book. (laughs) You read the books. Okay. Today we are doing the case of the Connecticut River Valley Murders. So it's not just on a victim, it's on a batch of victims, so we will be talking about... Several different people. Right, and it's going to be, we're going to be talking about the case a lot in general, so it's a little different, the format's a little different, but hopefully you guys either haven't heard this one before or you learn more. And also, not all of them are hiking or backpacking, right? The first victim is which is how I stumbled across this case. This killer is hunting in wooded type areas a lot or picking up hitchhikers or things like that. So, yeah. But you guys, I did spend a long time figuring this out, but now I know Google Maps a little better. But I did a Google map of the area because I was having a little trouble wrapping my brain. So we're going to post that for you. Yep. Around all of the different areas that these murders occurred. So this will be just on the seven well-known victims that are potentially linked to this killer. But I dropped a pin in the last place that they were seen, and I dropped a pin in where they were found, and I labeled those. So you guys will kind of get a better geographical idea of where this all occurred since it is kind of spanning a large area. Okay, so the Connecticut River Valley murder, or some people refer to it as the CT River Valley murders. But Well, CT is what Connecticut is, right? Yeah. So it occurs in Connecticut, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, and Vermont. They occurred from 1978 to 1987 that we know of. In all, it is believed that seven women were murdered by this killer. So that's how many cases they've connected to the Connecticut Valley River murderer. The reason most of them are connected are based on where they're found and how they're killed. So on October 24th, 1978, Kathy Milliken, who was 27 years old, she was an enthusiastic bird watcher and she was photographing birds at the Chandler Brook Wetland Preserve off of Route 11 Mm -hmm. in New London, New Hampshire. Between 5.30 and 6, she had parked her car in the lot and had walked to the preserve. Right, and the reason they know this is that about a half hour after they believe she left her car, a police officer actually drove by and noted that he had seen two cars in the lot. But he didn't see anything suspicious, so he didn't stop. Okay, so the next day when Kathy was reported missing, the officer had remembered the car in the lot the day before, and it sounded a lot like the description of her car, which was a Volkswagen Rabbit. Right, which is kind of a distinct car, so it makes sense that he might remember it. Unfortunately, it didn't take long for searchers to find her body. It was only a couple yards from where she had last been seen. So her skirt had been pulled down and she was partially covered with brush. Her car keys, binoculars, along with other belongings were found scattered about. She had been stabbed to death. She had had 29 stab wounds. Which to me, that's very, yeah, that's very extreme. And she's right off of the trail that people could come around. It's not a very secluded location for something like yeah. this. So on July 25th, 1981, so a few years later. Okay, so Mary Elizabeth Critchley. Everybody called her Betsy. She was 37 years old, a student at the University of Vermont. And she had long hair and she was often described as a hippie. She was really self-conscious about her bite. So one thing that people always remembered about her is she always smiled with her mouth closed. So she had actually found a dentist in Massachusetts, which I can't say for some reason we have determined, (laughs) who was willing to give her free dental care in exchange for the experience of it. So this is a little ways from where she lived, but hitchhiking was very common in the 80s. Yeah. Don't hitchhike, guys. 
After a long session of having her teeth worked on, the dentist and his assistant had driven her to the interstate, which was Mm I-91, so that she could hitch a ride home. She lived in Vermont. So a little bit of a distance, but a straight shot on I-91 if she could get a ride. She was never seen alive again. So she was found in a wooded area off of Unity Stage Road in Unity, New Hampshire. Yeah, kind of a mouthful there. She was wearing maroon denim jeans and a maroon sweater and a pink shirt that had flowers on it. That is exactly what I picture the 80s. She was wearing two rings at the time. One was on her ring finger and one was on her pinky. But even with this information, it still took them two months to identify her. So cause of death could not be determined and they think it was clear that she had not been stabbed. Right, and the reason for this is because she does not have stab marks in her clothes is why they think she was not stabbed. So I already sort of have an issue with this because now we have two different MOs. Yeah, always concerning. So on May 30th, 1984, Bernice Cortomage, who is 17 years old and lives in Claremont, she was a nurse's aide at Sullivan County Nursing Home She left work and had plans to meet up with her boyfriend, Teddy. He was at his sister's house in Newport, which was about a 10-minute drive from where she was, but she did not have her driver's license yet. So she had headed home to get a snack before heading his way. And guess how she plans to get there? Hitchhiking. So while she's at home grabbing a snack, her boyfriend's parents stopped by, and this is around 3.30. They had... Just stopped by to grab something. His dad jumped out of the car, went inside. This is where they lived. So her and Teddy lived with his parents. Okay. So this was around 3.30. And when they stopped by, Bernice was sitting at the table eating a peanut butter sandwich. She told his dad what her plans were and he offered her a ride. But she declined and said she would find one easy enough. So she would be hitching along Route 12. She was wearing a blue denim jacket denim pants, and brown suede shoes. Once again, a beautiful 80s outfit. Right? That, exactly. Madison wasn't alive in the 80s, so it fascinates her what we wore back then. I would still wear that now. (laughs) When she didn't turn up at her boyfriend's sister's house, he wasn't immediately alarmed and thought maybe she went to her parents' house or got distracted along the way. Her parents, though, actually weren't home. Her brother had actually gotten a fish hook in his eye, and her parents had taken him to the hospital. Cool. Right? So his thought is, well, maybe she went with them. And that's why she didn't have time to contact me. She left with them in a hurry. Maybe that's what happened. And when he discovered that she hadn't gone with her parents, he got really concerned. So around 6.30, Teddy and his sister's husband, they did go and drive the route that she would have taken, but had no luck. And he had reported her missing at 12.15 the following day. Yeah, which seems like a long time, but Bernice was described as a very independent person, so I think that's part of why he wasn't immediately alarmed and waited until the next day. Like, okay, if she doesn't turn up by tomorrow, something has to be wrong, right? Yeah. Her body was found on April 19th, 1986. Around noon, two fishermen came upon the body. It was off Cat Hole Road. That's a great name of a road i really want to know how that name came about cat hole road cat hole road so if anybody knows why cat hole road is named cat well, hole road we know people who live off of uh of intersection that's called woodcock and kitchen dick road yeah so i mean cat hole is kind of a step up from I, that, I think i don't know i guess uh anyway back to it so she was partially laying in a stream Her skull and upper torso were encased in her jacket, but a lot of her was missing. And part of why that might be is either carried off by wild animals or the stream that she was partially laying in could have washed parts of her away. Because we are looking at a, let's see, she went missing May 30th, 1984, right? She was found in 86, so. So that's that's a really big gap couple years yeah so i mean that could be part of it she did have a knife wound to her neck and they believe a head injury as well one weird thing about bernice is she has been popularly linked to another batch of cases in river valley 
from the 70s and 80s. Cold case detectives do not actually think that she's connected to these other cases, but they say they won't know until one of the two cases is solved for sure. And we'll talk a little bit about this area was slightly terrorized for a little bit during this time frame. So this is not the only crazy enough murderer running around. On July 20th, 1984, Ellen Freed, who's 27 years old, she loved nature and enjoyed camping and hiking. She had dark blonde hair and distinctive green eyes. She also had three piercings on each ear. She was a supervising nurse at Valley Regional Hospital. They weren't sure when she left the hospital if she was in her nurse's whites or if she had changed into street clothes yet. So we're not sure what she was wearing the last time that she was seen. She made a late night trip to use a payphone outside of Leo's market after work. Remember, we're in the 80s. People don't have cell phones. A lot of people don't have phones in their houses. She did not. Okay. So a payphone was her only option for making a phone call. And she called her sister Heidi in California, and they talked on the phone for about an hour. It's a long time to get a payphone, but late at night. Mm Mm-hmm. She had remarked that a car had driven through, and she stepped away to ensure that her car would start before she returned the phone to say goodbye to her sister. This does not surprise me in the least. So I used to live on a boat, and my only form of phone was a payphone. And so if you're going to, before you, for some reason, it feels safer to be on the phone with somebody when something goes wrong. So whatever happened when this car came through, it made her nervous enough that she felt the need to go and start her car before getting off the phone. Even though her sister's in California and can't do much to help her, but I can understand the stepping away to start your car. So the next day she did not show up for work and that weekend, her coworkers did get concerned. Yeah, she was very reliable and not known to miss work or be late for work or anything like that. So her car was found abandoned on the side of the road by police. So the doors were locked and nothing was amiss, but she hadn't been reporting missing. Right. So at this point, they find her car on the side of the road, but they're like, that's weird. The car doesn't seem disturbed. The doors are locked. Everything seems fine. So it was on Jarvis Road, only a couple of miles from the payphone that she had used. After she was reported missing, they had gone back to Jarvis Road and they began to search and a local pilot even took them up to see like the terrain and if anything was amiss or anything like that. Bloodhounds were also brought out. All terrain vehicles were brought out. Tips began to come in and one person even reported that she had seen a man driving that car with a canoe on top of it. But actually, this was later determined to be her boyfriend who had been driving her car at an earlier time with his canoe on top of it. So she had misremembered the day that she saw it. Okay. But kind of, I mean, she got that right, which was still yeah, kind of crazy. Yeah, which is kind of crazy. Yeah. Yeah, I remember that exact car. There's a man with a canoe driving. <laughs> they did search her apartment. They did not take fingerprints at this time. And after a few weeks, friends actually tracked down her boyfriend who didn't know she was missing. This was not a they see each other, talk to each other every day kind of relationship. I was going to guess because it sounds like she works a lot. So I'm guessing that Mm -hmm. they lived in separate places. They worked. I still think it's very interesting that the police didn't contact him initially, though. Well, and I think at this point they're thinking it's not foul play. Her parents actually took an ad out in the newspaper saying, help us find her. And it ran for 10 months. September 19th. 1985, a few miles away, her body was found in a wooded area near Sugar River. Yep, she had been stabbed multiple times, and there was evidence of sexual assault. But what that evidence is, is unclear. I couldn't find anywhere what exactly made them think she had been sexually assaulted, because we are looking at July of 84. Yeah, we're looking at a year down. Over a year. Right, so was she missing her pants? Like, what made them think that she had been sexually assaulted? I'm curious. Her body was only found a thousand yards from where Bernice's body was found. So pretty dang close. So at this point, no one was connecting her to Bernice. Who had only gone missing two months earlier. Right. Mind you. Yep. So now we have multiple women that have gone missing or been murdered. So at this point, the police are only connecting Bernice and Ellen. On July 10th, 1985, 27-year-old single mother, Eva Morse... 25, 27. What? You said 25-year-old. I don't think so. Did I? I think you did. Hold on. 
We gotta check something. I'm pretty sure you said 25. I was wrong. I was wrong. I'm pretty sure we we did this multiple times in our last episode where you're like, I didn't say that. Uh, Madison has some... Bad hearing in Is general. that a hearing issue, though, when you hear 25 <laughs> instead of 27? Maybe my dyslexia also is like... I feel like that's listening? so much bigger than a hearing issue. I don't know. Anyway... <laughs> On July 10, 1985, 27-year-old single mother, Eva Morse, disappeared. Eva did have a bit of a rough adolescence. She had had her daughter at the age of 17 and had actually hid the pregnancy from her family, which I still do not understand how people can do that. A few weeks before her disappearance, they'd actually celebrated Jenny's 10th birthday. That's her daughter. She had been saving up for a 10-speed for her and was super excited about it. So... A couple of things about Eva that set her apart from some of the other women that have gone missing. Who were nurses and such things like that. Right. So we're not saying anything negative about Eva, but it did change the way that her case was investigated, I think, because she did not fit the typical type. So she is added into these victims or this list of victims, But initially, police did not believe she was connected. Jenny had never graduated high school, and she had consistently moved from job to job and place to place. She ran with a slightly rougher crowd, and police seemed to think that initially, this made her unlikely to be connected to the other disappearances. So, she didn't physically match the rest of the women. She's a little overweight. Another thing, too, is... She was actually bisexual, which I do not understand why the police think that that would make a difference. So I'm not sure why that led to them making decisions. Making some kind of... Or making assumptions about this case. But for some reason, they played that as a factor. The only thing I can kind of see as her not fitting the type would be her physical description, which is different, which a lot of serial killers usually stick to one type of... One specific type. Yeah. She was last seen near the border of Claremont and Charleston. She had left for work that morning and hitchhiked to J.H. Dunning Box Factory in North Whalepole. So it was about an eight-mile drive from where she lived. She arrived at work at 7 a.m., but she never punched in. She told a supervisor that she was sick and going home. But someone that had spoken to her got the impression that she was actually sneaking off to see her former girlfriend, Carol. When police called her sister to ask if she had seen Eva, her sister's first reaction was, it must be something bad because she would never, ever take off and leave Jenny without making plans for her to be taken care of. Because remember, she's got a 10-year-old daughter. So when her sister arrived three days later, she was shocked that nothing had been reported in the media. And we see this, right? We see this with cases where some of them get a ton of media attention, a ton of searchers, a ton of everything, and then others get none. Kind of makes me mad. Makes me really mad. So her sister actually paid herself to put an ad in the paper, which cost her $14.80. Okay, so it had a description of what Eva had been wearing, which was a light blue windbreaker and jeans. I bet you her jeans were light blue too. Probably. 80s look. So this did get a newspaper to run a story about her disappearance, which happened on July 19th. So 10 days after her disappearance. A month after she disappeared, an entire month, yep. police set up a roadblock near her work around the time that she would have left work to try to catch commuters that leave. Right, that travel that same route every day. Mm-hmm. And their goal was to ask everybody if they had seen her on that day a month earlier. I don't even remember what happened a month ago. Well, not only that, but if she hitchhiked on a regular basis, it might be hard to determine what specific day somebody had actually seen her. But... A woman did later come forward saying that she had picked up Eva and driven her as far as her work, which was a veterinary clinic at Knights Hill near the Charleston Claremont line. So the last place she was seen was... This veterinary clinic. Yep, outside the veterinary clinic. Her remains were found on April 25th, 1986. Which is... About a full year later. Mm Mm-hmm. So they were found in Unity, New Hampshire by loggers, who were also brothers, by the way. They were about four miles from where she had last been seen. And you guys, they were only 500 feet from where Mary Elizabeth 
had been found five years earlier. 500 feet. What are the chances of that? And also, guess who found Mary's remains? The same exact loggers. Yep. Wait, actually the same ones? Yep. The exact same two brothers? Yep. You're joking. No, I'm not. That's such bad luck. Or they're the killers. Or that. They are actually Mm. not suspects. We think it's just bad luck. But pretty crazy, right? No, I think they're not the killers. No, I think that because (laughs) I think that why else would you... What are the odds that you come across multiple dead bodies while at work? Well, what about the one case where the search and rescue guy found the two dead bodies while they were looking for the other two missing hikers, and then he stumbled across the two bodies of the hikers that they were initially looking for? That was our last serial killer one, wasn't it? What episode was that? Well, I think these loggers are the murderers now. Totally Again, the these two brothers are not suspects in this case. <laughs> So there was evidence that she had knife wounds to her neck. Sounds familiar. Yeah. This was just over a year since Bernice had disappeared and less than two months after Ellen Freed had disappeared. But remember, police are not thinking it's connected, which I'm sorry. How? Yeah, exactly. So on April 15, 1986, Linda Moore, who's 36-year-old mother of two, she lived in Saxon River, Vermont, Her house was a short distance from I-91. Hmm. She had been outside. So most reports say she had been outside doing yard work, but when I really dug into it, it sounds like she actually laid out in the sun is what she was doing outside in her bathing suit. And it was very common. And there were people that said that they would always look for her when they were driving by and hopefully catch a glimpse of her in her bathing suit. You will see that it says she's outside doing yard work, but I couldn't find any actual truth to that. It sounds like the husband and everybody else implies that she would have been laying out in the sun. (laughs) But. That's what I'd rather be doing than yard work. So around lunchtime, her husband had sent one of his employees. So he had like a construction company. Okay. So he had a lot of men that worked for him. So he had sent one of his employees from the construction site to the dump. And then on his way back from the dump, he was supposed to stop by the house and pick up a check to pay for the dump run. Linda actually handled all the finances of the company. So she would be the one writing the check to him. So she kept the books for the company. And then she also worked part-time in a store in Bellows Falls. The employee, so when the employee didn't come back at a very reasonable time, he actually called her. So he called Linda to see if the employee had left the house yet. And when she finally answered the phone, he said that she sounded annoyed and he assumed that he had interrupted her, that she'd been outside and had to come in to answer the phone. But she told him that he had already left and that he should be back soon. And the employee did pull into the parking lot shortly after that. He called her a few hours later for the same reason. So another dump run was being done. He was going to have the employee stop by the house. She didn't answer the phone, so he assumed that she had gone out. He decides to leave and head to the house in order to be there for the employee to write him a check. He passes the employee on the road. So they're they're basically driving at the same speed, right? They're almost both to the house. They get to the house. He's kind of annoyed initially when he sees her sob in the driveway because he's like, why didn't she answer the phone? I could have stayed at the job site, right? Their St. Bernard Abigail was actually laying in the front yard under a spruce tree and her folded up lawn chair, portable radio, and her sandals were by the door. So he goes inside to a horrific scene. She had been stabbed multiple times, something like 24 times. She had a lot of defensive wounds and it appeared that there had been a fierce struggle within the house but only in that small section of the house. The rest of the house appeared to be untouched. So no, like, robbery is motive or anything like that? Police actually tried to stop the kid's school bus before it got to the house, but they were unable to find the right one in time. So their 12-year-old son and their 8-year-old daughter got off the school bus about 3.30 and had to be stopped by the father before going inside. So neighbors did report seeing a sketchy character near the house. He had been wearing a blue backpack and was stocky with dark hair. A composite sketch was made. He appeared to be between the ages of 20 and 25. He was also clean shaven, had a rounder face and dark rimmed glasses. 
Because there are multiple accounts of this person. Yeah. Right? Oh, and there were also reports that he may have been hitchhiking. Here's one thing that I'm wondering. With so many neighbors and witnesses around, he's got to be pretty lucky to have made it into the house and back out without being seen. Also, would he not be covered in blood? There's so many neighbors are like, oh yeah, I saw this guy. Well, and people reported seeing her outside, sunbathing. So, I mean, obviously, this is a small town. People are looking, you know, they're, they're, they're looking for Linda in her bathing suit sitting yeah. outside. So, how did he get in and out of this house without anybody actually seeing him do it? Of course, what do the police jump straight to? Husband did it. Yep. It's always got to be the husband, right? Always the spouse. It's always got to be the husband. Eh, sometimes it always is the husband. A lo- I was going to say a lot of times it is the husband. So they thought that he was acting really strange. His employee that had driven there to get the check for the dump, the husband actually took the time to go upstairs and write him a check while he's got his wife's blood on him. Which, yes, I understand that that's kind of a strange thing to do, but I, I'm guessing that's a shock thing. He's in shock. His employee is standing there. Probably just wanted him to leave. He goes, take this. You go do this. I'm going to stay here. Like just Right. So I, I would contribute that to shock myself because I think a guilty person wouldn't do that anyway. I think a guilty person would be laying on the ground wailing over excessively to make himself look innocent. But that's just me. He had only been away from the men on his job site for about 10 minutes to grab a sandwich. And they did end up finding the receipt in his car for that. Right, so it's opportunity that we're kind of missing in this situation, right? For him to have done it. For him to be... Because he barely beat his employee back to the house to write that check, and they do not think he would have had time to go in and kill her at that time. So they're thinking, oh... Not even just did she die, but she had over 20 stab wounds. It takes a long time to stab someone And he would have been covered in blood at this time. He would have needed to change, right? So they're thinking, well, he came home earlier than maybe and killed her. But there just does not seem to be enough time for that. No. She had also been dead for a couple hours when he found her body. Yeah. So obviously he didn't Timeline get to the house and do it. just doesn't add up correctly. Right. He also took a polygraph and passed. Even though polygraphs mean nothing. Exactly. Timeline-wise, I'm thinking that maybe when she went inside to answer the phone when he called her, to see if the employee had left earlier. Was when the man followed her inside. Yeah. Because her stuff is still outside. Like, she wasn't quite done outside, maybe. Or was packing up and getting ready to go inside. But I'm guessing if her phone was ringing, maybe her guard was down. And he was able to follow her into the house and attack her as soon as she hung up the phone. That's kind of what I'm thinking. Which makes sense. There's a man named Triplet, which we think is his last name, mm. the suspect, for this murder. Yeah, he actually claimed to have a vision about the murder and was able to describe her wounds and the position of her body, which made them suspect him of killing her. A lot of serial killers would try to insert themselves into... Yep. And he had also told his girlfriend that he thought something bad was going to happen at the Moore house. His lie detector test was inconclusive. I'm not surprised. So he was given an alibi that day by a woman he was seeing. We know how reliable those are. Super reliable. It also came out that there were reports of a man getting water from a nearby stream for his broken down car. A blue van had been reported in the driveway. A man urinating in the woods and two men jogging, one of them with a messed up face, were also reported near the house. We've got some really nosy neighbors around here, I think. Yeah, seriously. Like what? What? And, of course, the sighting of the man in the sketch who had the backpack. So yeah. those are all separate occasions. So Jeffrey Miller ended up being really looked at for this case as well. So he was actually out jogging that day with his brother, and his brother was the one that had damage to his face. They had been out jogging. At one point, the brother had gone back or had gone home, and he had continued on by himself. He was not seen jogging in the area at the time of the murder, though. He was seen before, and he was seen after. He actually went for two jogs that day. Weird. So he was in the Navy, so I don't know how strange this was that he's out jogging twice that day. But there were theories that maybe he was the man that had been in the field or something like that. Okay. It would have been a really 
tight timeline for what he would have been able to do during that time because he did stop and visit friends as well that day. Also, he would have been covered in blood. He was deployed shortly after the murder, which made it really difficult to actually interview or do anything like that with him. So the Navy helped with that, and they even gave him a polygraph. They collected evidence, but everything came back negative. So they collected this that they thought maybe had blood on it, but it wasn't, things like that. So we don't know. We're not saying he couldn't have done it, but there was really no way to link him to the actual house. So still don't know how people saw him jogging multiple times, but never saw him leave the house with, like covered in blood. Right. There's also a back door and there's a river behind the house. So the theory is maybe that whoever left the house went down to the river to clean themselves okay. off and left that way. So, on January 10th, 1987, Barbara Agnew, who was 38 years old, she had blue eyes, brown hair, down to her waist. So, you know, another hippie. hippie. (laughs) She was a nurse. Mm -hmm. Another nurse. Yep. Which, at this point, I don't think is a coincidence. So, she lived in Hartford, Vermont. She was a single mom, and her son's name was Neil. She was described as energetic and cheerful. So she'd returned from skiing at Stratton Mountain with a man that she had recently met, and they skied all day, they had dinner before she headed home, and it was after 10 p.m. by the time she'd gone onto the road. So nice a and late. A little late, yeah, a little late. And definitely, like, pitch black outside because it's January. That evening, a snowplow encountered her green BMW at a rest stop on I-91 in Hartford, Vermont. That's only 10 miles away from her house. Yep. Yeah. So her door was cracked open and there was snow piled around the door and inside. So her car was kind of like half against a snowbank, like the backside of it. And then the front of her car was actually in the road. Right. So I would think at this point, oh, somebody spun out, lost control of their car or something like that. Mm -hmm. If I were this snowplow, they probably see this all the time, right? Yeah. So the car was towed out of that area. Later, an attendant at the rest stop had seen somebody kind of over by the dumpster and went to see what they were doing. And they actually found a jacket in the dumpster and it looked new and it looked undamaged. So he didn't know if that person was trying to get it out of the dumpster or if they just thrown it away in the dumpster. But he pulled the jacket out of the dumpster and in the pocket he found an ID for Mary who worked at Hitchcock Memorial Hospital. He also found the name and number of Barbara who's one of Mary's friends He called that number but got no answer, which this is already, like, above and beyond what I think an average rest stop attendant would be doing, right? But the jacket looked too nice, like it didn't belong in the dumpster. Yeah. The rest stop attendant had also called the hospital. Because of her badge that was found in the pocket. Yeah. And they had contacted her ex-husband, and after checking her apartment, he called the police. Police went to the rest stop and discovered that a car had been towed from that rest stop. So they're thinking maybe there's a connection, right? After calling in, he did find out that the car was registered to Barbara and went to examine it. Her skis were missing from the top of her ski rack on her car. Which the important part of that is when the driver of the snowplow saw her car initially, there were skis on top of the rack still. But by now they're missing. So did like someone who towed her car took her skis? Maybe also it took a while for the car to get towed out of there. So anybody could have taken the skis off the top of the car while it was parked at the rest stop. This is a little bit of a sketchy area. Okay. There was blood on the steering wheel and on the front seat. Yep. So a massive search ensued around the rest area. The first day only yielded some hair and some blood and nothing else was found that day. Remember there had been a lot of snowfall by this by this point. Yeah, so more snow has fallen. Searching is going to be very difficult to actually find anything. By this point, police are thinking maybe the skis and her clothing had been taken out of the car. They took the skis with them and put the clothing in the dumpster when they didn't find anything of value in it. Investigators had struggled to understand why she stopped so close to her house. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a little strange as well she's only 10 minutes from home but maybe she needed to pee maybe she saw the sign that said free coffee and thought oh i could use some coffee because a lot of rest stops here anyway 
people, there are volunteers there that serve coffee to tired drivers. Yeah. Although this particular night, there was no such volunteer there. But there are vending machines. Maybe she thought... I've stopped at a rest stop pretty close to being home just because I needed to get out. Because I was tired. Because I was so tired. That's kind of what I'm tending to lean towards as well because it is after 10 p.m. by the time she leaves dinner and was skiing all day. Mm -hmm. So I don't think that's super weird. The police do make a lot of the fact that she stopped there. You know, was she picking up a hitchhiker? Was she stopping to help someone? Who knows? All possibilities. But I have stopped at rest stops many times just to stand up for a second, get some fresh air if I'm driving late at night especially. Yeah. I mean, we'll never really know why she stopped at the rest stop, but... So, Randy, the man that she had gone skiing with, was given a polygraph, and he did pass the polygraph. She had also been online dating, and they did their best to rule out any men she had had contact with in her online dating world as well. According to the mileage on her car, she had not taken any side trips that day and had basically driven straight from skiing to the rest stop after dinner. The reason they know this is because they actually found a receipt in her car that had been serviced the day that she left to go skiing. So she had had some sort of service done to her car that day. Which she was going on a long drive. Maybe she got her oil changed or just had a checkup done to make sure that everything was good with her car. Why she stopped, we don't know. But a woman also did call to report that she had stopped there that night and had kind of an uneasy feeling and decided not to get out of her car. After getting all of the evidence from the car and deducing what had happened based on the position the car had been left in combined with the damage on her door. So she had this damage on her car door. And the best way I can describe this is if you've ever seen Tommy Boy where he backs up when his door is open at the gas station and the door bends backwards because there's extra strain on it. You know? Mm -hmm. You know what part I'm talking about? Yeah. So basically they think that her door was open when she backed into the snowbank And the pressure of her car door scraping against the snow is what bent it back a little bit. And that's why there's also snow inside her car. So after that happens, maybe she tries to close her door and somebody prevents her from doing that. So there's just this pile of snow that's being drug into her car. Okay, so this is kind of the thought. So she stops at the rest stop to do some sort of task, right? Go to the bathroom clean snow off her window. Maybe her windshield wiper yeah, is stuck from snow that one and time? ice. Oh uh-huh. my gosh. So this one time we were driving over the pass and we have our whole family packed into the car. So the car is packed full of children and stuff. We're yeah. driving over the pass. It's in the winter. It's like literally, it's snow. Dumping snow. It's dumping snow. Yeah. We're driving really slow because the car's not doing so well. And the all of a sudden, wiper gets stuck. our windshield wipers start to like freeze because it was raining a little bit and uh-huh. then they like froze so so the windshield wipers are doing nothing they're not moving which i thought i'll just hang out my window and try to break the ice off of the windshield wiper right that seems logical until the windshield while wiper we're driving off the car i broke the windshield wiper off the car trying to get the ice off of it but there's no place to stop, which is why I was hanging out the window to because do it in the you, first yeah, place. Yeah, because you can't pull over to the side of the road because the snow was so high on the side. Yeah, it was there's, nowhere to, the road. there's nowhere to stop. So, yeah, we, we survived, but that was a bit of a sketchy drive. I thought it was funny. We, all, we were all laughing. Yeah. So she stops to do her task, and then her car is still running at the time that she stops, right? So she stops. She goes to get out of the car. When she's approached by a person or some sort of something that scares her, she's maybe struck by the assailant or stabbed. She flees. She gets back into the safety of her car or maybe wasn't fully out of it when she was attacked because there's blood in her car, remember? So she gets back into her car or goes back into the safety of her car And tries to back her car up. Maybe because she can't go forward. Maybe somebody has blocked her in. We don't really know. But she tries to back her car up and her door is still open when she does that. Maybe because somebody is preventing her from closing it or because she's just panicked at this time, right? Yeah. So that's how she ends up with her door open going into the snowbank. Because remember, the ground is slippery. It's icy. She's probably in a panic. She ends up in the snowbank. And then yeah. is either taken from her car or persuaded out of her car at that point. Makes sense. They did find one fingerprint in the car that didn't belong to Barbara. 
Which, I mean, how many people get in a Dude. car throughout time? If I ever get killed and my car is part of evidence, first off, no one's going to be able to figure out fingerprints because there's so many people first that off, get First off, I feel like bad for whoever does that because your yes, car is so car's dirty. My car's a disaster. <gasps> also, because I don't wipe down the inside of my car on a regular basis. Which is disgusting. So my yeah. car's only going to have... Probably my fingerprints and your fingerprints in it because I wipe my steering wheel down on a regular basis. Like at least I wipe my steering wheel down. At least once often. a week, I wipe down the surfaces inside my car. I really only do my steering wheel. That explains a lot because your car is. So Barbara is immediately connected to Bernice, Ellen, and maybe Eva. In case you haven't realized, Kathy is not connected to any of these yet. Which was the first victim we talked about. Which was the first victim we talked about. So... They have not connected Kathy to the other cases yet. On March 28, 1987, a woman from Hartford, Vermont, is out on a walk with a couple of visitors that she has that are from out of town. It's a Saturday afternoon, and the snow is just beginning to melt and give way to spring. They stumble across, guess what? A body. Yep. What else would we be talking about here? Of course. So specifically Barbara's body. Yep, and they find it near an apple tree, and she's still wearing her snow bibs and a purple sweater. So this woman immediately recognizes the description of the missing woman and Mm. figures that's what they're dealing with here. Her ski pass is still visible and hanging from her clothing. I feel like that I had to have multiple ski passes. I had, you know, my one on the outside of my jacket that says I'm allowed to be there. And then they gave me one to put inside my jacket that had my name on it. Yeah, that's what actually lets you through the thing. So that's what unlocks the little lever that lets you go through to the ski lift. And then the tag just says that you do have permission to be there. So they can immediately identify if there's somebody there who's not supposed to be there. Mm -hmm. But the outside tag doesn't get you through the security. Okay, because I remember I had one that I had to put on the inside of my jacket that had my name on it. Yep, and that needs to be up high because that's where their sensor is for their... Uh, that would make sense. Mm-hmm. There is also a red stain surrounding the area around her neck. So she had been stabbed to death and her neck wound had appeared to happen from behind at an angle. Because if she had been stabbed in her car, because immediately when I read that, I thought, oh my God, there was somebody hiding in her back seat or something that jumped out and stabbed her, like yeah. got in her car while she was in the bathroom at the rest stop or something like that. Because... That's like a scene out of my nightmares, and I could see something like that happening. But I don't think there was enough blood in the car for that to happen. So yeah, so initially I thought that, but they actually determined that she had been killed in that apple orchard. Okay. So this means, you guys, that the killer had driven there with Barbara still alive in his car, which was about a half hour drive from the rest stop. Jeez. Ugh. So at this point in the investigation... Detectives have been consulting with a psychologist, and he actually gives a ton of insight into this case. He worked with police a lot in this case, and there's a lot of information about him in one of the books that I read as well, so I'll share that with you guys at the end. But he gives a lot of insight, and he actually determines at this point that Linda Moore may be connected to the Riverside murders. Because remember, Linda Moore is the one that's killed inside her house. Mm -hmm. So she had not been connected to the rest of the murders. Yeah. So now at this point, they've connected Bernice, Ellen, Eva, and Barbara. And then in February, they get a tip from a nurse who worked at a hospital in New London, New Hampshire in 1978. She said that a man had come in with cuts all over his hands and arms and had been behaving very weirdly. So we've seen that in other cases where killers go into the hospital after killing someone and they're like, no, I don't know how I got that cut. Or, oh, I was trying to stop a robbery at a 7-Eleven. Oh, I got bit by a dog. I got bit by a dog, right? So we have seen that from time to time. She said that he had also been crying about having hurt someone, which that's kind of a red flag. Yeah, no, red flag for sure. But the more she thought about it, the more she thought that it might have something to do with that woman that had been stabbed to death while bird watching. The detective had no idea what she was talking about. Because remember, these cases are in 
Oh, different, different towns, counties. different counties, right? They're not necessarily talking to each other. And the databases are not the same that they are now. Yes. And surprisingly, I feel like this happens a lot where murders aren't connected just because of crossing a county line. Yep. Even if they're only 10 minutes away and from each other. And that's all it takes. Yep. If you're so, going to be a productive serial killer, you should probably go across county lines. There you go. And state lines. Pro tip right there. The detective did say that he hadn't heard of the case, but that he would look into it. And when he did, he was shocked that he knew nothing about it. It had been just across the river, and yet it hadn't come up in any of their searches or their bulletins. Because when the murder started, they did look at nearby cases, but for some reason, this particular one didn't come up. And the case that we're talking about, of course, is Kathy Milliken. And remember, she was the first woman murdered Yeah. in this string of murders, right? When they did get a hold of her file, they immediately noticed the stab wounds were very similar to Barbara's. Their neck wounds were almost identical, and they had both been stabbed on their lower torso. So her neck wound also appeared that it had been delivered from behind and at an angle. So one issue that they had with adding this case was that it wasn't in Connecticut Valley, and the rest of them had been, but it was in New London. But it's still close by. Only 20 miles. It's about 20 miles away. Yep. Also, there were no signs of rape, but she had been posed in a suggestive way. Remember, her skirt was pulled down. But I don't know if I really trust any of that, the whole sexual assault being found and not being found, because they don't tell us why they see signs of sexual assault. Well, because remember, only one other of these women had signs of sexual assault, but she was found years later. So I'm not sure... How? What determines that? Also, could this have been his first kill? Maybe he thought he would be a rapist, and when he was unable to, he turned to stabbing them, which we know can be a replacement yes. for rape. Also, did he learn at this time that he didn't have enough time with her? He didn't have enough seclusion with her. Maybe somebody he thought somebody was coming. Maybe he saw the police car drive by. I mean, we don't really know what happened at this time. Mm -hmm. After this one, a year and a half goes by before another attack. Took a break. Which maybe there's, maybe this killer has a family thing. Maybe he got locked up for another kind of offense. Another crime, right. Which happens quite often where serial killers, they don't willingly stop. They're forced to stop by incarceration. For some reason or another. Or maybe his, yeah. maybe he has a family and his wife had a baby. That does tend to put a gap, more mm-hmm. of a gap in them, yeah. This is going to be the end of our first episode. Right, so this is probably a good spot to stop and... Sadly stop. Yes. And and you're going to have to wait till next week. And take a break, but we will be back next week with more crazy information about this killer. He's crazy. And you'll also get to hear what we think next week. Yes, we are going to keep our opinions to ourselves until next week. For the most part, I mean. But we have... It slips out a little bit. We have... A lot of theories, and yeah. so do a lot of other people. I mean, people have chosen their killer, and that's that's it's it. crazy. Yeah. So thank you for listening. Come back next week. Yeah, for the second part. Come back next week. We're going to be posting some polls. Yes. So be on the lookout for those, and please vote on them. Yep. And keep a lookout for the post because we'll post some things with this episode as well. Yeah. So thanks for sharing us on your stories. Follow us on Instagram. Yep. Yep. Tell your friends. Tell your friends. Come back next week. Thank you for taking the time to do reviews. Sorry that we didn't post one last week. Yes. Thank you for being patient with us. We love you guys. You're amazing. You can hate us just a little bit. Just a little, though. All right. Thanks, guys. And we'll see you next week. Bye. Bye. Everything sounds good. Madison's chewing. I'm I'm chewing. This was not a good snack to have right now. Mm, I love when the yogurt has seeds in it. That's why I like the blackberry and raspberry. I it's like a weird texture thing because I don't mm-hmm. like chunks, but I, I like, like having seeds. something in it. Um, when I was telling you the raspberry flavor, twisted teas, they taste like raspberry seeds. No. Mm-mm. I, I do not like artificial raspberry flavor. I need you to There's try something it. about it. I need you to try them. I promise I won't like them. And I definitely, I've had raspberry tea before, and I think it's disgusting. I don't understand how you, like, don't like twisted teas. 
Who doesn't like twisted teas? I I think I would like tea and alcohol. I don't like tea and lemonade. It's the the flavor that I don't like. The lemonade, the lemon flavor, the raspberry flavor, it's that. Why? You like Mike's. But that's not lemon and tea mixed. I can drink... It doesn't I can make drink, sense. It, I don't know. I can drink tea with alcohol, and I can drink lemonade with alcohol, but I cannot combine them. It's, it's an Arnold Palmer. I just don't like it. Millions of other people do, though. It's a very commonly liked item. I just don't like it. By the way, guys, we're eating right now, so we're not officially starting yet. Today on the menu, we have cherries... We have rice cakes with peanut butter and bananas. And I have blackberry yogurt. And Maddie has blackberry yogurt. And I have a blackberry lotus. So. It's funny. That's where we're at. And also. Blackberry peach thanks to Brina. Thanks, Brina. And then also, I'm possibly having an allergic reaction to something. <laughs> we don't. We can't figure out what it is. So if I sound kind of off, it's because I'm almost dying. My mom's dying of her, uh allergic reaction and i can't hear anything oh so. my epi pen is in my hiking backpack in the closet right yeah, there. yeah you're extremely expired epi pen but do they really expire so my probably my epi pen you guys is expired when did it like 2010 <laughs> like so long ago <laughs> i think when we looked it up it expired like 10 plus years ago i think it expired in 2010 so i am deathly allergic to ants which is super a fun. pretty common thing, by the way. In case you're wondering, well, ants are common. I don't well, think being no, allergic to them that's is what I common. meant. Is that yeah. ants are common? Like you see ants fucking everywhere. Which on Madison's first birthday, I almost died because I was wrapping streamers around a tree in the front yard, and I got bit on the leg by an ant. Not a big deal, right? Mm-hmm. Never been bit. Before, which I grew up running around in the woods, I played with ant hills. I've never been bit by yeah. an ant before, I don't think. So I, I oh, just kidding, it. I take that back. I have been. Oh. So I flicked it off my leg, and didn't really think about it a, a second time mm-hmm. until I couldn't breathe, and my throat started to swell, and my entire body broke out in hives. Hence, me finding out I'm allergic to ants and almost dying on Madison's first birthday. So I'm just good luck all around. I think maybe that makes you bad luck. If it wasn't your birthday, I wouldn't have been putting streamers up. Well, exactly. And I wouldn't have almost died. I was obviously being sarcastic. <laughs> uh, but we're almost done eating and we're going to get started with our recording here. Don't worry, I'll move this to the end or something so you guys don't have to listen to it. If you don't, if you don't want, want to. to. <laughs> uh.